Amen. Good to see you guys. Pastor Jins is jealous because he's been trying to grow the same beard for about five years. <laughs> oh, Jin, don't be jealous because some of us are more manly, brother. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see everybody. Open your Bibles up, if you would, please, to Luke chapter 23. <laughs> You don't make fun of the next guy who's coming up with a microphone, man. You don't do that. <clears throat> Luke chapter 23. We're going to start in verse 13. We're going to start in verse 13. We're going to read quite a bit. Um, obviously, I'm going to... We've got communion today, and this was kind of, you know... Pastor Jin actually taught on this um, a couple of months back uh, in this particular chapter. Um, I think it's just appropriate for communion. Um, I look forward to having communion with you guys. You know, um, as you guys know, we, we've discussed uh, planting a church coming up in the next year or so, and so I am going to be uh, kind of relishing these moments and just really giving thanks for these moments that I'll be having with you over the course of the next couple of months. You know, so just keep that stuff in prayer. Um, it's kind of bittersweet. It's something that the Lord's kind of laid on our hearts. We've been praying about for a long time. And, um, but certainly, um, it's going to be kind of a, uh, for lack of a better term, it is, it's going to be bittersweet, you know, lots of people, lots of history, uh, but at the same time, just a, uh, a calling and a need to just do what the Lord has called us to do. And God has called us to plant churches going throughout the, all, all, throughout the whole earth, you know? And so that's just kind of, that's what we're doing in obedience to the Lord. And, um, as we, you know, take communion today, it's, going to be a, uh, not, not gone yet, anyway, Luke 23, here we are, let's have some laughs, all right, verse 13, then Pilate said, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man, concerning those things of which you accuse him, no, neither did Herod. For I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. And they all cried out, with one, uh, all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion and made the city, I'm sorry, and made, made in the city and, a, uh, and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus again, called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released them, the one that they requested, for rebellion and murder that had been thrown into prison but he del- and delivered Jesus into their will. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon the Cyrenian, who was coming from the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him and women who also mourned and lamented at him. But Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and the breasts which never nursed. They will begin to say, The mountains will fall on us to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There were also two others, criminals, led to him, led with him rather to be put by death. And when they had come to the place they called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they delivered his garments, and they divided his garments rather and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. 
But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, As surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there, were, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought us out here this Lord's Day, this Sunday. I thank you, Lord, for your truth. I thank you, Lord, that you guide and guard us by it, Lord. I thank you for your spirit, and I just ask in Jesus' name, Lord, each one of us coming here this morning, looking to have an interaction with you, Lord, looking to hear from you, looking to just hear from heaven our home. I pray, Lord, that these words would be lifted right up off the pages and and into our hearts, Lord. I pray that we would be changed by them today, that something here, Lord, would affect us, Lord, to the degree of change. Each one of us, Lord, continually being molded and shaped into your image, Lord, and I just pray if there's even, even one or two or three or ten, Lord, that have never professed Christ as their Savior, Lord, have never made that open profession, I pray that today would be that day. I pray, Lord, today that your will would be done. And I ask in Jesus' name that you would just speak to each one of us and speak to our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Recently, <clears throat> I had a friend who passed away. And uh, I found that as I get older, that uh, more people just pass away. It just happens. And it's, I, I don't think that it's more people. I think it's just more people to me. More people who I know. More people who I'm familiar with, whether it's whether they're young and, you know, just kind of falling to this epidemic, this, this opioid epidemic that's sweeping across the nation, or whether it's just older and, and health conditions are causing their, um, their hearts to give out and their health to fail. And he was relatively young. He was a retired firefighter. He was a good, good friend of mine. And um, I say good friend. He was a good friend through the fire department. He wasn't somebody I'd known all my life. But he was a good friend of a, of a good friend. And this friend of mine called me one day and was talking to me about it. And I offered him my condolences. He was very tight with him. And I'd offered my condolences. And he looked at me and he said, no, rather on the phone, he said, I don't know, but the big guy upstairs is going to have to give me some answers someday. He's got a lot of answering to do. He's going to have a lot of explaining to do because there's one thing I could never really understand. I could never really understand human suffering. You can never really understand because this friend of mine took a little while to pass away. He was suffering for some weeks. Hospice had been in his house for some time. And the reaction to that can be very, it, it can be offensive. Death in and of itself is offensive. It's not something that should be looked at as, as, as good. We should never look at death or the death of a friend or the death of a family member and be joyful. Now, for those of us who have family members who have died in Christ, it's bittersweet at the same time. It's this time where you know that this person is now <clears throat> walking on streets of gold. The next person that they saw when they closed their eyes in this life was the face of Christ. And that's the miracle. I mean, that's the blessing. That's the hope that we have within us. That the, the very next person that they saw was Jesus saying, enter into the joy of the Lord. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That, those are things that we look forward to hearing. But at the same time, we're missing the person that's gone. At the same time, we're going to miss... The, the presence of that, of that individual. We have history and we have a, um, an emotional attachment to somebody that, that you love. And so my friend was touched by that. I don't know if the man that passed away was saved. I don't know what happened in the twilight of his, of his hours and minutes in this life. I know that my buddy who was talking to me is probably not. And so, he felt as if he had been betrayed. He felt as if he had been, that the Lord has to, has to explain to him this problem, this death issue. And I don't, hear me on this. And again, and we do, we, we, we know as Christians, we, we, know that, we know that the Lord doesn't have to explain any of that. But I get the thought behind it. 
Do you understand? Somebody who doesn't understand God would certainly say, why? What, what is going on? <laughs> this is, this is, it's offensive, man. Death is offensive. It, 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 to, 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 to watch somebody die. It's never easy. It's never easy to... to and, it, and by the way, it shouldn't be. For those of us who work in any field of medicine or first responder or whether, whatever, it should never be something that's looked at and you should be used to it or calcified to it. It should always offend us. It was never supposed to be that way from, <laughs> from the very beginning of time. We were supposed to be living forever. Beings that were supposed to live forever. Sin entered the world and dying you shall die, is what he told Adam. Sin entered the world and for me, you take a look at the effect of the sin that entered the world. Adam didn't kill anybody. He certainly was only one other human alive. He didn't kill his wife. The sin that caused the entire world to suffer was just one act of disobedience. An act of disobedience that started somewhere. It started in the heart and started with just a willingness to want to do things our own way. And the entire world was affected by it. The whole universe. The law of entropy had now, had now really taken root where everything began to decay. The ground, I was outside praying under the tent and I'm looking around. You guys know, some of, these, some of this landscape out back here is really beautiful, isn't it? It's weeds. They're pretty looking weeds. And every single time I see a weed popping up out of the ground or crabgrass that's affecting my lawn. Every time I have to say, this goes back to the dawn of creation. This goes back to God saying to Adam, because of you, cursed is the ground now because of you. You don't have to plant weeds, man. They just come. They're all over the place. They drive you nuts. They're, they're everywhere. You look outside on the rocks. Man, it makes me crazy that those weeds are coming up through the rocks. If you guys know what I'm talking about, I'm a mental when it comes to that stuff. And there's weeds coming up through the rocks. But all it does is remind me of the fall. It reminds me of what happened. It reminds me, you go back and you take a look at what God told Adam. He said, because of this, Cursed is the ground now for your sake. You will now have to till the ground by the sweat of your brow. He, he had been tilling the ground before that, but it was effortless. It was easy. Now he's going to have to work. He's going to have to work hard to plant, to sow and to reap, to weed the garden. And, and all of these things are a picture of sin. But the most difficult part about all of that was that in order for his sin to be covered, an innocent substitute had to die in his place. He tried to cover up his own sin. We know the story. He and his wife, they tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves, probably big giant bush leaves, big ones. Tried to cover themselves up. They realized that they were naked. They were ashamed. They, they were afraid. They ran and hid. But an innocent substitute needed to be given in their place. So the Lord killed an animal and covered them with the skin of that animal. And that was a picture of Jesus covering the sin. The question is valid. The question is still valid. And he doesn't have to give an explanation. He has. If you read his word, he's given us the explanation. He's given us the reason why death is so difficult. He's given us the reason why we suffer in this life. He's given us the reason why, why all of these things, why we take a look around at our world and nothing, nothing's getting better. The law of entropy is in effect with creation in and of itself where everything is decaying and everything's getting worse in our own moral lives. The moral decay of humanity. And we can see the effect of humans and their heart towards God in this passage. People's heart towards Jesus is always, by and large, the world's response to Christ is always going to be aggressive. The response to truth and holiness and righteousness is always going to be aggressive. And it's always going to be met with opposition. 
The truth of the matter is, is that Jesus had been dealing with humanity forever, ever since he created us. And he subjected himself to, himself to that. And you see the heart behind every person screaming out, yelling out, crucify him. And who are they talking to? They're talking to a politician. They're talking to a politician. And let, let me say this, whatever side of the aisle you fall on, please, please let me say this to you. There is no hope in politics. No hope for this country in politics. I don't care what side of the aisle you fall on. There is no hope for our country in politics. The only thing we can do is vote our conscience, and I, I encourage you to do that. You vote with the Word of God. You vote with truth. You go out there and you, and you, and you, you do that rightly. We've been given a right to do that as Christians. We should exercise that right. But the thing is, is that you have to try and understand that the only hope that we have in this country, the only hope that we have in this country right now is in us. The light of the, we are, we are now the light of this world. You know that. We've got the light inside us. Jesus is the only hope. We're the ones that know the truth. We're the ones that should be praying. We're the ones who should be ready to give an answer. We're the ones who can explain this. And as I'm talking to my friend on the phone, I'll never understand it, he says. I'll never understand human suffering. And when I, get, when I get to heaven, he's got a lot of explaining to do. I said, how do you know you're going there? <laughs> Think about that. That's the question. It's funny. It's a good retort. But it's the truth. When I get to heaven, he's got a lot of explaining to do. I said, how do you know, how do you know you're going? You number one, <laughs> how do you know you're going there? And number two, he said in his word, in this world you will have tribulation. In this world you will have trouble. In this world you will suffer. In this world you are going to go through things. And he said this in his word. Jesus said this in the red letters. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. My kingdom is not of this world. He stands before a politician and says that very thing. This is not where I live. And by the way, this is not where we live. And as crazy as that might sound to the world, as crazy and as, as outlandish as that may seem to the rest of the world for us to actually sit there and claim that and know that, that we don't live here. You say that to somebody who's not saved, they're like, you're a quack. <laughs> I get it all the time. Man, I, I don't live, I'm not getting comfortable here. I'm not getting comfortable here. Right now, my wife and I, were going through the process, as you guys, many know, going through the process of trying to find a home, and we've, we've, we've figured out a general location as to kind of where we're going to be going to start a church, and we're, we're, looking, at, we're looking at homes, okay? And it, this is a, for, for those who are, have ever been in the real estate market, this is a process. I would rather put my tongue in a vice. <laughs> this process is arduous and tumultuous cutthroat man especially in the market right now things are crazy and here i am getting frustrated we leave open houses my wife and i we're going back to the house i'm like this is so stupid i can't believe that people do this all the time this is ridiculous man we're just trying to i just want to buy a house and here i am getting frustrated and getting get, just getting very very cantankerous here I am just looking at what's going on. And I'm like, man, this is brutal. These people are coming into these open houses with cash offers. Oh, yeah. How am I going to keep up with that? Now, yeah. as I'm done, and as I'm leaving those things, and as I'm going home and driving home with my wife and children, the Lord still has to tell me, relax, you don't even, <laughs> you don't even live here. You don't even live here, man. I don't. It settles me down. Still frustrating, but it settles me down. And you see the heart of people here in this passage. You see the heart of people as they cry out and are yelling out against somebody who had never done anything wrong ever. Ever. Nobody could bring a charge against Christ. Not one of them. Nobody could say he even fractured the law. Nobody could sit there and say that he, was, that he was slighted anyone at any time or even said anything wrong. In fact, God 
couldn't even say that he thought anything wrong. And that, for me, blows me away. Never thought anything wrong. Never had one sinful thought. Many of us have many sinful thoughts in and throughout the day. Most of us don't act on them, thankfully. But God sees the heart. He sees the mind. He sees our thoughts from afar off, is what it says. So him examining his son tells me that he didn't even have, a, he never at, one, at any point in time did he ever have a sinful thought against anybody. That's, a, that's superhuman to me. But yet people, and the people, were still angry, still frustrated. And in verse 24, I want you guys to look at the response of the politician. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. This is the whole reason why I'll vote, but my trust is not in politics. I don't care who it is. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Trump says he's not a politician. Yes, he is. He is now. Hillary Clinton's not a politician. Yes, she is. She always been. They are politicians. They will inevitably bow to the will of the people. Our job is to vote, but our job is to stay focused on Jesus. And this was the problem. None of them were looking at Jesus. None of them were looking at him. All they were doing is looking to feed and fulfill their own sinful desires. That's what they were looking at. None of them were looking at Christ. They just look at what he stood for and hated him. And they're going to do that now. And because they did that with him, they're going to do it with you. And me. He examined them. There were six examinations of Christ. And this was the final one. The final examination of Pilate. Pilate was the last one to sit there and look at him and say, that's it. He'd been given to Herod. He'd been given to the Jews a couple of different times. And at the final examination, Pilate was the one that finally said, okay, that's it. And he begins to compromise. He begins to compromise. So he leads him away. He chastens him. He chastises him. He scourges him. By the way, if that was against the law, according in the the time, if you were a Roman and you declared, if you are a Roman leader, and you declared that there was no fault in anybody, and then afterwards you chastened him and you chastised that person, after declaring that there was nothing, that they were innocent of any crime, and every crime, you were breaking the law. You're breaking the law. So immediately he starts to kowtow to the will of the people. Immediately he starts to, to act in cowardice towards what the people are trying to get him to do. And on top of that, he lets go a murderer. Somebody who was arrested for insurrection and murder. He was arrested for rebellion and a murderer, straight up. This is somebody who took it upon himself to take the law into his own hands. We know this man Barabbas was probably a member of the Zealot Party, and they were notorious terrorists to Rome. They were, they were called dagger men. What they would do is they would go up to Soldiers, Roman soldiers doing their job, whatever it was that Roman soldiers do, and they were difficult to deal with. They, were, they absolutely ruled Israel with an iron fist, and they were not any way, shape, or form easily bend, easily to bend or malleable. And so what they do, these daggermen, they would sneak up behind a Roman soldier, and they would find the soft spot in their armor, and they would take these daggers from in, inside their, um, inside their uh, sleeves, and they would come up alongside them and stab them and walk away in the midst of a crowd. And that, they were notorious for this. And so, chances are, this is what Barabbas did. You know, we all have that vision. Everybody's seen the movie, right? Everybody's seen The Passion of the Christ where they bring out Barabbas and he's this big kind of burly guy with the crazy eyes and the funky teeth. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that Barabbas was that type of guy. Somebody who led a rebellion and somebody who was part of the Zealot Party was somebody who was very, very smart. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that this guy was a caveman. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that he was stupid and didn't know what he was doing. He probably knew exactly what, it was, what he was doing. And by the way, probably knew the effect of what, he, what would happen if he got caught. And he got caught. And he got tried and he got convicted. And his sentence was death. And he was guilty. Just like the other two were guilty. 
And reading some kind of extra biblical literature about the history of this moment, it tells us that there was scheduled crucifixion for that day. Three people were scheduled to be crucified. These two thieves and Barabbas. Barabbas was probably the leader of this whole clan. That's why he was the one that was in the middle. And it's funny, do you know the name Barabbas? If you break down the name, Bar-Abba. Bar-Abba. If you guys know anything about Hebrew or what Hebrew names mean, it means son of the father. Now history tells us also, some extra biblical literature tells us that his name, his first name was Yeshua, Joshua. His name was Joshua Barabbas. Joshua, the son of the father. And if you guys know anything about Jesus, that was his name. That was his earthly name. It wasn't Jesus. We got that name from the Greek and the Latin and all that stuff. His name was Joshua. Yeshua. That was his full name. This man sitting in prison, named Joshua, son of the father. Sitting in prison, waiting to die. Waiting for his execution. Waiting for probably the worst type of execution that has ever gone down in human history. This was not what we see, the very nice kind of picturesque thing of the, of the crucifix. For those of us who were raised in Catholic Church and we got that nice picturesque view of Christ and on the cross. And it looks a little bit painful, but it doesn't do any justice to what a real crucifixion was. A real crucifixion was a horrible, horrible way to die. Your feet were probably eaten by jackals for a good part of a week, week and a half. And then you would sit there and rot to death, literally, for days and weeks, hours. Sitting there, wanting to prop yourself up, and you would suffocate slowly. That was what made crucifixion so difficult. Romans were masters of death, and they were masters of torturing people and really ruling with an iron fist over people. And that's what they were doing. And this was the, this was the judgment that was to be executed onto Barabbas. He was the one that was supposed to die because he was guilty of murder, guilty of rebellion. Jesus wasn't guilty of any of those things. And you can just imagine, now listen to me, as somebody who has experienced salvation, and you can put yourself into this position, somebody who has realized, who knows the deep root of sin that's, that's in me. That nobody else knows. It's just me and God knows about. Imagine being found guilty for everything that I ever did. And all of a sudden you're, you're this man sitting in prison. Waiting to die. The most horrific death that anybody could ever imagine. And you're sitting in this dungeon and all of a sudden you hear the jailer come. And you hear the, the shaking of the keys. And you hear the keys going into the door of the prison that you're sitting in. And all of a sudden you hear the door prop open. And the guy says, come on, you're going home. Imagine. Imagine after being found guilty of rebellion, rising up against your government, and murder. You've been completely exonerated from any and all charges. You've been let, you are set free. And the man that he sees as he comes out, as he's been set free, he's getting ready to be delivered to the people because they were crying for him. The people were crying for Barabbas. That's who they wanted. The man who he sees standing in his place is Jesus. The man who's taking the penalty for his sin is Jesus Christ. The man who's standing in the place for all of us the man who stood in the place of every single one of us for the entirety of human history and human future is Jesus Christ. He stands there and he's having this interaction with him. He takes a look at him. And again, I don't buy the movie that he was this hideous looking troglodyte that they brought up from the bottom pits. He was a man. He was a man who looked at Christ, looked him dead straight in the face, and realized that this man was standing in his place. He goes on. I'm gonna, I know we've kind of puddle jumped across some of this stuff. In verse 24 again. Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Now as they led him away, 
they laid hold of a certain man, Simon the Cyrenian, who was coming from the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of people followed him. And women also mourned and lamented. And I want you guys to look at the heart of Christ. But Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. What an amazing word. You guys see, after Simon the Cyrene gets tapped on the shoulder, this was called the Angarian right. This was something that Roman soldiers had the right to do to anybody. You want to talk about persecution? We don't even know what persecution is. This was a right of every Roman soldier to be able to go up to anybody that they were ruling. Take their sword or take their spear. And if you were just kind of standing there talking to your buddy, just talking about whatever, okay? Talking about the football game, reading the paper, whatever. A Roman soldier could come up behind you, take their sword, tap you on the shoulder. And what they would do is they would leave it there for a minute. And if you felt that cold steel on your shoulder, that meant something. That meant that your day was ruined. Whatever it was that they were doing, you were doing with them. That was the law. So whatever it was that they told you to do, at that moment, you had no choice. You had to stop what you were doing and do whatever it was that they called you to do. Now you take a look at this man, Simon. Simon the Cyrenian, history tells us and the Bible tells us that probably he was, he was from North Africa, probably from Libya. More than likely, he was there for the very first time, wanting to enjoy the Passover with his family. The Bible tells us in other accounts that his sons were there with him. So he's there wanting to enjoy the Passover with his family. That's all he's thinking about. All he wants to do, how could we equate this in our mind? All he's been doing is he's been away for a long time, and all he wants to do is get together for Christmas with his family. All he wants to do is get together for Thanksgiving. That's, that's how we can picture this here in our culture. He's trying to enjoy the festivities with his family, and all of a sudden he comes into this melee. This was no small thing going on in Jerusalem. This was a melee. This was... Everybody, I mean, from all walks of life, spitting on Christ, ripping his beard out, punching him in the face, watching him bleed all over the ground as he's walking the Via Della Rosa, bearing his cross. And he walks into this going, what is going on? What is going on here? All I wanted to do is celebrate the Passover with my family. And they compel him, the Bible says, but it's really an even firmer word. They order him to carry the cross for Jesus. They order him to do it. He had no idea what was going to happen. No idea who this guy was. No clue. And his day was completely, listen to me. How many of us have had this interaction with Christ? One day, everything's going along. What we would seem to be, fine. And then we have an interaction with Jesus. And it changes our lives forever. This man didn't walk with Christ. This man didn't go on the long excursions with Jesus. This man didn't see Jesus walk on water. This man didn't see Jesus raise the dead. This man didn't see Jesus do any of the miracles. He didn't see, uh, didn't see Christ cleanse the leper. He didn't see any of those things. But he had an interaction with Jesus. And as you read in through the scriptures, his two sons were affected by this too. His two sons were foundation, founders of churches. One of them started the church in Spain. The other one got martyred in Jerusalem for his faith. All from this one interaction that Simon had with Christ. And he saw what happened. And it wasn't just what he was seeing. It's what he heard Christ say. Daughters of Jerusalem, he says, don't weep for me. Listen to me. This is the heart of any true leader. Don't worry about me. You need to focus and weep for yourselves and your children. Because what's coming, and what, was, what was to come shortly thereafter in AD 70, was the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Thousands of people burned alive in the temple by the Romans. Indeed, the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. They will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? What he's basically saying there is he's saying there's going to come a time where all of you women with children See, the women who were considered to be barren were considered to be cursed. And what he was telling them, he was, force, he was foretelling them. He was saying, there's going to come a time where all of you women with children, young children, are going to look at the women who couldn't bear children and look at them as they were blessed. It's going to get so bad. It's going to get so bad. 
that everything that's going on right now is going to pale in comparison. Hello? <laughs> Somebody's phone. Somebody left their phone up here and didn't shut it off. Interesting. <laughs> the time is going to come. The time is going to come where things are going to happen and things are going to happen so fast where you're going to wish that you never had kids. That's what he's saying to them. The difficulty in that. The hardness of hearing that. But listen, the question was asked. I'll never understand human suffering. Human suffering was a guarantee. It was a guarantee. Never anywhere in and throughout the scriptures did God ever say that people weren't going to suffer for the case of God or the case for Christ. For in, in, in fact, if you are in Christ or anyone who stands on the truth, you may suffer more. Maybe not to the degree of this. Maybe you won't have your family murdered. Maybe you won't do, but you are going to suffer a little bit more. There are also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, (laughs) where they crucified him, that word Calvary, right? That's the mountain. That's Mount Moriah where Christ was crucified. This is where we get Calvary Chapel. But the actual name of the place where Christ was crucified was Golgotha or the hill of the skull, the mountain of the skull. So you can tell everybody you go to Skull Chapel. (laughs) There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right, And the other on the left, and then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. They know not what they do if you have the King James. They have no idea what they're doing. And in the text, in the sense of how he's saying this, he's repeating it over and over again. As they're nailing his hands into the cross, he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. As he's nailing his other hand into the other side of the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. As they're lifting him up and getting ready to drop his cross into the hole, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And if you read the other gospel accounts, these criminals are sitting there. Both of them were mocking him. You read the book of Matthew, it says that they were both mocking him. Both of them. The two of these guys are sitting there making fun of him, mocking him. They were joining in with everybody else who was mocking Christ. They were doing exactly what everybody else was doing. They were falling under the peer pressure too. And then all of a sudden, in and throughout this process, they hear the heart of Christ through the words that he's saying. And one of their hearts begins to change. In and throughout this process, they're seeing this man who the Bible says his visage was marred more than any other man. They see that the Bible who wrote about in Isaiah 53, this very day is coming to life before their very eyes. And one of them realizes this and his heart begins to change. One of them takes a look at this and says, man, somewhere in and, in, and, in and around his heart, there's something's happening. Life is beginning to grow. We were just praying this morning, the leaders, we were downstairs and we were praying this morning. Jim was praying and it spoke to me when he said it. I don't know. He was praying. He said, Lord, I don't know. I don't know why I got saved and the guy right next to me didn't. I don't know. I don't know how I was reading that track one day and the track just spoke to me and it didn't speak to the guy who was standing right next to me reading the same thing. I have no idea. I don't either. I don't have an answer for that. All I can tell you is it's the Lord's will. That everybody who comes to Christ comes through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. That's all I know. And as the word is going out, see, the word is going to produce one of two things. It's either going to produce rebellion or life. Jesus himself said, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing, he would say. And the words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And so it's going to do one of two things. The word of God is going to go out and it's either going to soften somebody up or it's going to stiffen them right up. Those are the two responses. And for whatever reason, one man's heart here starts to change. One man's heart listens to forgive them for they know not what they do. Because the human response to this, I'm hard pressed to think that anybody going through this type of persecution would have this type of response. The human response would be, the natural 
response to what's going on is, what are you doing? I didn't do anything wrong. Get your hands off me. Get me off this cross. Get me down. I, the guy who's been ripping out my beard. The, this is the human response. This is unjust. I can't believe you're doing this to me. This is wrong what you're doing. That's the human response. The divine response is, Father, forgive them for they don't know. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know what they're doing. Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And this man watching this, watching as this innocent man would have sweat and blood pouring off his face, his face so mangled that you couldn't even make out his appearance. His visage marred more than any man. I've said this before and I'll say it again. I don't believe that the Bible exaggerates. So when Isaiah 53, when it says that his visage was marred more than any man, I believe that. I believe that he looked like an animal. I believe that our Savior was so beaten beyond recognition that he looked like an animal. His beard ripped out. And so, the effect of that, as they're bargaining for his garments, as the soldiers are continuing to mock him, and as they put a sign above the cross, it's more or less Pilate's sign as kind of the last dig to the Jewish leaders, because they didn't want anyone to sit there and say, here is Jesus, the king of the Jews. They wanted him to take that sign down. He said, nope, what I've written, I've written. One of the criminals in verse 39, one of the criminals who hanged and blasphemed him, saying, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other one, the other, we don't know his name. All we know is that his name is the other. So when we get to heaven, we'll see him. We'll say, hello, you must be the other. Answering, rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing that you're under the same condemnation? Don't you understand that we deserve to be here, he says? We deserve decided to break the law and we got caught this is one thing i could never understand amongst those of us maybe who did at one point in time fracture the law from time to time when you get caught breaking the law you are caught you are entitled to a defense under the constitution of this country yes but you just got caught breaking the law stop breaking the law And you won't get caught anymore. This man, very simple. We deserve to be here. We were busted. We've been tried, convicted, guilty. But this man, he hasn't done anything wrong. No one can find any fault in him. He's been acquitted and he's still hanging on the cross. Where's the justice in that? Completely and totally exonerated by the government and he's still hanging on a cross. In verse 41, he said, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Not a week from now, not a couple couple days from now, today, right now, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. That guy didn't have time to come off the cross and go ask for forgiveness. He didn't have time to go get confirmed. He didn't have have time to go get his first communion. He didn't have time to go get baptized. He didn't have time to do anything. His hands and arms and feet were all jacked up on a cross and he couldn't get down. The only thing he could do is with his heart change and confess with his mouth to be saved. That's it. That's all he needed to do. And today, that's all you need to do to be saved. That's it. What an amazing truth. (laughs) All you need to do is have your heart changed and believe in your heart. That's all you need to do to be saved. And confession is made unto salvation. What was going on in his heart came out in his mouth. By the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. He realized that this guy was innocent. And he realized that there was something different about him. He wasn't from this world, clearly. Because anybody from this world would be saying, you guys are all dead. You don't know what you're dealing with. (laughs) Something changed. So, as we take communion...
As we take communion today, I just want you guys to remember this. For us, for us who know Christ, for those who don't, for those who are looking for an explanation, the explanation is the cross of Christ. The explanation for why and how and how can God let this happen. The only innocent person in all of humanity forever was murdered, crucified, wrongly convicted for us. So if there is anybody ever in human history that should be able to ask, why? Why, Lord? And he does at the cross, and we know the scriptures, but, but for anyone to be just and saying, Lord, what is, why? This is wrong. Whatever it is, this happening to me is wrong. The only person who ever said that, said this, who, who was ever able to say that, rather, said this, Lord, Father, forgive them. That's what he said. His response was not a human one. It was otherworldly. His response was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now listen, our response should be, forgive me. Positionally, for those of us who are saved, we're saved in Christ and we're solid. He's got us. He's got us in his hand. He's never letting us go. Heaven is our home and that's where we're going. We battle, we suffer, we go through things day to day, week to week, hour to hour. We deal with these things. However, for those of us who may not be Today is the day unto salvation. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as the word says. Do not have your hearts hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Today it's free. Salvation is a free gift. It goes out free. It costs Jesus everything. An innocent substitute in our place, and it goes all the way back to the dawn of creation. In order to be saved, all you need to do now is believe it. Just like the thief on the cross. You don't got to get down. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to speak in tongues, do backflips down the aisle. You don't have to fall down and start shaking and bobbing and weaving. You don't got to do anything like that, except for all you got to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. It's just that simple. What a great God. Who is like Him? Every other God, every other human, quote-unquote, deity, every other God made up by humans requires a sacrifice of human suffering. Do this and you'll be made well. Do this and you'll be made whole. Even certain sects of Christianity, or quote-unquote Christianity. True faith. And believing that Jesus is who he says he is. And I read this. And as we go on, we're going to have communion. This is the stuff. For those of us who have been walking with the Lord for any amount of time, we know this. With a lot of this stuff we know and we're familiar with. A lot of this stuff kind of, a lot of this stuff we've heard people preach on many, many different times, commentaries and so forth. And, you know, we know the biblical truth about the crucifixion, but I'm going to tell you something. Every once in a while, I have to read this and remember what and who exactly died in my place. Why do I have everlasting eternal life? It puts things into perspective for me. So Christ's explanation for anybody who asks is explained on the cross. God himself veiled himself. The word became flesh and literally dwelt and tabernacled among us. God himself suffered on our behalf. But here's the thing. And if you zoned out, don't zone out to this. This is not as good as it gets. It gets way better. Hear me? It gets way better. Inexplainably better. To know that when I shut my eyes in this life, to know 
that when I see Jesus according to his word, the Bible says that I will be like him. It gets way better. And only through the broken body and the spilled blood of our Savior. Not our spilled blood. Not our broken body. Let's pray. Thank you.